In that single night, we burned to death 100,000 Japanese civilians in Tokyo, men, women, and children. Are you aware this was going to happen? Errol, would, would you maybe uh, tell us a little bit about how your time in Madison as a student uh, has influenced the kind of work you do now? Someone asked me either today or yesterday how I became a history major at the University of Wisconsin. Why history? Was that in the plan at the outset? Um, and in fact, it was not uh, to the best of my ability to remember any of this. Uh, I became a history major because the history department was where it was all happening. Um, Some things never change. Uh, after the fact, uh, people have told me that uh, the history program here was the best in the country. And having been to a lot of different schools over the years, I can attest to the fact that that is really, it's not hyperbolic, it's, it's really uh, a true claim about this place. There were extraordinary historians. Um, it's interesting, we were just having a conversation moments ago about history as a branch of moral philosophy and how the uh, professors who were incredibly influential on me when I was here in the late 60s, were um, thinly disguised moral philosophers um, with very strong ideas about the meaning of history and what you could learn from history, what history was about. Um, there's always a meta level to all of it. And, uh, it it has had an enormous effect on my, on my life and, and what I do as a filmmaker. If you're about to be executed for a crime you didn't commit uh, and you tell people that you're innocent, that you didn't do it, you don't want to hear people temporizing with you about how it really makes no difference. I, I spent three years of my life investigating a murder, the murder of a Dallas police officer in, uh, uh, in the 1970s. And a man who was sentenced to death for this crime, a uh, crime which he did not commit. He was innocent. Um, and what motivated me through all of this is just some very simple idea that there's a fact of the matter. Um, either this guy shot the cop or he didn't. It's not something that is in any way subjective, it's objective. How does that, I mean, how does that connect to your, to your film work? I mean, is that, is, that your, is that one of the main philosophical wellsprings for your work as a documentary maker? Are you uncovering facts that have been obscured? Well, it has to be at least part of it because the Thin Blue Line is an attempt to show that this man is innocent and the 16-year-old kid who was the chief prosecution witness, who, by the way, later confessed to me uh, uh, that he had been responsible for the murder, that he was the culprit. Here's the example I often give. Um, if there is a lockbox with all of the evidence for the Battle of Hastings, and it's destroyed, well, you're in trouble. <laughs> um, and so part of what we do as historians, or perhaps even as a filmmaker interested in history, is to try to preserve some aspect of the past before it's unutterably lost. It doesn't necessarily have to be there forever. History is indeed 
perishable. Um, so with someone like Robert McNamara then? Yes. Is that, is, that, is that what you were doing with McNamara? Were you trying to preserve something before it was lost? Absolutely. Um, that and the uh, fact I had been obsessed with him for many, many, many years. I told McNamara that I had demonstrated against him um, a couple yards from here. Uh, uh, in 1968, 1969, he was already, okay, to truth be known, he was already out of the Pentagon. But for all intents and purposes, it was against him. It was certainly against the Vietnam War and the escalation of the war. Uh, I think it's a very proud moment in this campus's history, uh, something that I'm still very proud to have been part of. Um, I think of the Cheneys over in faculty or graduate student housing on the other side of campus, uh, and then the people who were actually out on Bascom Hill um, and in the Commerce Building objecting to uh, our policies in Southeast Asia. I think it's a very important thing, and a thing that did have enormous influence. Uh, I believe. Um, so yeah, I have been fascinated with McNamara all my adult life, and it was an amazing opportunity. And I continued interviewing him after I finished the movie. I have, I have about 40, 50 hours of interviews with him that I just sit on like a big chicken with an egg. Well, I assume you'll put those in our archive at some point <laughs> soon, right? I think we should turn to some questions from uh, the audience, in particular from students. This is a great opportunity all of you have to ask, uh, ask your questions. Yes, please identify yourself also. Hello, my name is Jay uh, Whatever you wish, go ahead. Uh, I, uh, my name is Brendan. I am an uh, undergraduate in history. And uh, I wanted to ask you about Don't do that. <laughs> yeah, don't do it. How's that for input? So let me just repeat the question. So Brendan's uh, really two-part question is, uh, first of all, how someone with a uh, history degree who's interested in film should go about doing that, whether film school is the way to do that or not. And then second, uh, how one should think about the moral philosophy and history and a career path in general, right? Is, yes. that, is that fair? Well, I've always been puzzled by people saying that they want to make films. Um, films about what? as if somehow the act of making a film is an occupation. I'm not really sure that it is. I think that you should have, and I'm sorry to moralize about this, but I think you should have films that you want to make. Um, uh, I mean, f filmmaking is a really interesting way to to, to do history, among other things. Uh, but I don't think that I, I started making films because I wanted to be a filmmaker, per se. I started making films because I had ideas that I wanted to express, and that was a vehicle available to me. Um, I'd been thrown out of a number of graduate schools and it was clear I was not going to have an academic career, so I had to do something to earn a living. <laughs> um, and so filmmaking became, by the way, I was mistaken. It's a terrible way to earn a living, but uh, I didn't know that at the time. Making commercials is a good way to make a living. 
So how did you make that transition, though? How did you go from being a historian, um, someone who realized you didn't want to become um, a professor or, or have Oh, I always did want to become a professor, actually, <laughs> which is one of the odd things about at least my career path. Um, uh, I was spared. In fact, maybe I lucked out. Who the hell knows? Uh, because um, it was clear that I was, I was never going to finish my doctorate. Um, that I was never going to get uh, to be a professor anywhere. And I had that sneaking suspicion that if I were to become a professor, I would have a really hard time getting tenure. <laughs> so maybe, maybe I lucked out, I don't know. And so I've had the opportunity to do a lot of things um, that really are academic in nature, even though I haven't ever been part explicitly of an academic institution. I've been very fortunate in that way. How did, you, how did you learn to make films, though, if you didn't go to a film school? You um, don't just pick up a camera and start making films. Yes, right? you do, actually. Um, I, I beg to differ. Um, the only way to learn how to make films, well, I'm not going to say it's the only way, but at least it's the way I learned, is through making horrendous mistakes in an effort to make a film. Um, I mean, that's how you learn. And of course, there's the other major university for filmmaking, and that's the movie theater, um, sitting and watching movies, uh, which I started here at the University of Wisconsin, at the Wisconsin State Historical Society Library, which was the recipient of these thousands of Warner RKO prints. Um, Right, so question, great question. Who, who, are you, who, who do you make your films for, and how do you conceptualize your audience, and how do you reach your audience is part of your, your question, too, right? Well, part of it is, I think, delusional thinking, is thinking not too clearly about whether people are going to even see them at all. <laughs> because if you were scrupulous, you probably would never start making a film in the first place. But... Of course, the hope is that they will be seen, seen by a lot of people, and that will make people think. Maybe they, they will think about the same things I've been thinking about, or they'll be animated by the same concerns that I've had. I mean, the uh, Abu Ghraib film, Standard Operating Procedure, um, was motivated by a whole number of, of different interests that I had, interests about photography, um, also, this idea that I could do the flip side of the fog of war. I could interview somebody who was at the very apex of power, arguably during the Johnson administration, the second most powerful person in the world. Um, and that I could make a movie about people who had absolutely no power who were at the very bottom of that pyramid, Lindy England, Sabrina Harmon, um, people who were manipulated by policy, not people who made policy. Um, the hope is that people will find what you find interesting without any guarantee that that's going to be the case. I'm not so much in the popular entertainment business, um, for good or for bad. Uh, but do you do anything, anything differently when you're making a film, like the Abu Ghraib film, or the McNamara film, or the Thin Blue Line, knowing your, as you're thinking about your audience, maybe about presumptions they'll have, about prejudices they might have? I just want it to work as a movie. I want it to be interesting. I want it to be engaging. I want people not to leave the theater <laughs> during a screening. <laughs> um, I mean, one of the horrible things, I just finished another movie, and you've 
premiere these movies, wherever you premiere them, whether it's, it's an initial screening in a theater or is it film festival or wherever, you sit in the theater if you, you can bear sitting in the theater. And essentially your eyes are glued to the exit signs to see if people are leaving during the screening and this horrible feeling of failure if uh, every, it's like you could have a clicker, every single person approaches the, the exit and uh, are they going to the bathroom? Are they going to come back? Or is this it for them? Now, now you see, <laughs> as a professor, I can offer you one piece of advice. If you could grade them, they yes. wouldn't leave the room. Yes. Right? You, need to, you need to have the right to give them grades. Right? I, that, I, that'll I, keep I, them in the room. By the way, I do give them grades. <laughs> <laughs> but, um. We should take another question. Yes, <laughs> yes sir. Frost Nixon. Frost Nixon, in a sense. Well, Frost Nixon is bullshit. Because, <laughs> first of all, Nixon never apologized to Frost. And the whole movie is a charade. Uh, Ron Howard and Brian Grazer should be ashamed of themselves. But that's not a um, What I like to point out is that I'm a Jewish boy from Long Island. I'm not a priest. I don't hear confessions. It's not part of my job description. And I used to think, OK, um, I forced McNamara to apologize to me. And I would think, who the fuck am I? What, I'm going to stand in for the 3 million Vietnamese dead or the 58,000 American lives lost in Vietnam? Um, yeah, sir, I'd like you to apologize to me. For all of this. Um, and I started to think I had no interest in hearing McNamara's apology. Um, it seemed beside the point. It seemed irrelevant. It still seems to me irrelevant. Um, To people who say that McNamara is not dealing with or grappling with the fact of that incredible carnage in Southeast Asia, the whole movie is about his attempt to deal with it. Um, I can admit to war crimes with respect to Japan, but I can't quite admit to them with respect to Vietnam. We took this film, you can stop me at any time, by the way, if I'm going on at too much length. We took this film to the International World Court in The Hague. Uh, and I went with Samantha Power, and, uh, who has written a, a Pulitzer Prize a winning book on genocide, and McNamara. We showed the movie to the International Criminal Court with McNamara, which is sort of like surreal. Um, and we're downstairs talking um, to one of the judges, and they're talking about laws now on the books with respect to genocide. Uh, and war crimes. And McNamara is saying to the guy, he says, you know, I wish we had books like, uh, laws like that on the books in, you know, in the 1960s. And the guy <laughs> looks at him and says, sir, we did. <laughs> That's wonderful. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, John? Well, Speer, Speer is, is this amazing, um, one of the things that is always, I, I, did he meet him? Oh, yes. See, I didn't even know this. This is fabulous. This is really interesting. Everyone knows who Albert Speer was? John, the great Nazi architect, the one who was going to design, well. 
If you were really, really, really unkind, you could call him the Robert S. McNamara of the Third Reich. And um, I was going to say the, uh, the Robert Moses of the, of the Third Reich. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a very strange book. Actually, it's apropos of what we're talking about here um, by Gita Serini, uh, which is her attempt. I mean, it's a really interesting question. Her attempt to get Albert Speer to fess up. It's this idea of the purpose of an interview, purpose of a documentary, whatever. Uh, her attempt to say, Al, come on now. You knew about the Holocaust. Speer says, no. So then, you truck out the various documents. You say you were present at this meeting. Uh, uh, it seems to me here that Himmler was going on at some length about um, the liquidation of European Jewry. What did you take this stuff to mean, sir? So it goes on and on and on in this vein. And Albert Speer, in my view, never budges. Uh, and so the entire Gita Serini book, for me, and maybe this is my odd reading of it, but for me, becomes an exercise in self-deception. Her self-deception and Speer's self-deception. Her self-deception and thinking that she's gotten anywhere with this guy when she, in fact, has not. And Spears' self-deception that he has no knowledge of what was transpiring in the Third Reich. But I guess there's, oh, go ahead, John, I'm sorry. Um, well, I, I, my question is, well, first of all, I would, I'd like to say that I think that your career is the career of a historian, that you use other means. History by other means. <laughs> Without tenure. Without tenure, thank God. <laughs> so, so John has asked Errol to reflect on the, the glory years of Madison and the, the ferment in Madison. I believe they were glory years for this, for this university. Um, people ask, why isn't there that same level of social protest, say, in the uh, years of the Bush administration against uh, the war in Iraq? And there are all kinds of theories. Certainly one of the central theories is that there is no longer a draft, and so parents uh, and kids don't f have the same investment as that they had in the 60s uh, and the 70s. Um, and I've talked to certainly a lot of people about this, and I myself have always felt that there should be a draft, even though I have a young son, because I feel that, that war shouldn't be separated from um, our democracy as though it's something that just occurs over there and really has no meaning for us here. Um, these two history professors that we talk about, Harvey Goldberg and George Mossy, um, Goldberg's lectures were given at Ag Hall. I don't know if that's used for history anymore, but it was the largest uh, lecture hall on campus. It may still be the largest lecture hall on campus. It held over 1,000 people, I believe. There was standing room only. It was absolutely packed. And Goldberg was lecturing on 
uh, people would jokingly uh, refer to it. It was called European social history, and they would call it socialist European history. Um, but uh, it was really impassioned and, and quite extraordinary. Um, he held over a thousand people in rapt attention, uh, unforgettable. Uh, lectures that really had this enormous moral force. Uh, the feeling that you had coming out of a Goldberg lecture was that, that history could be changed, uh, that bad things had happened in history, but there were forces for good, there were forces for evil, and you could become actually a force for good. You actually could have an effect on the course of history. Um, it's a very, very powerful lesson to be given. Um, just talking about these two professors in the last couple of days, um, realizing that they, I don't like to think of myself as being a moral person because it sounds so pretentious, uh, self-serving, grandiloquent. But I think you do have, at least I feel I have a duty to seek the truth, to try to understand the world, to try to figure things out to the best of my ability. It seems to be a very deep and important enterprise. Um, it's not so much the job of condemning or finger pointing, but the job of trying to understand things, which is a different kind of job altogether. Um, Mossy, we were talking about also uh, earlier today, uh, perverse. Uh, ironic, dark, um, sarcastic. There was an element, I would say, of the sarcastic and the nasty in his version of history. And yet he too actually was a moral philosopher. Um, uh, about the importance of ideas in history and how ideas really defined and transformed history. Uh, uh, these two people, I had a lot of other history professors, but uh, you know, other names come to mind of people who I studied with here, Gargan, Herlihy. Um, there were a lot of really mm -hmm. fabulous people here. What about the student community? Did the students, I mean, because it's extraordinary the number of students in your field and in other fields uh, who came out of here. And, and I'm always struck by the number who call themselves moral philosophers having come out here to, at that time. Just a lot of bright people, a lot of energetic, gifted, bright people. Um, I've silenced everybody. This not is for, not for long. John? <laughs> I'm not sure I answered your question. And if <laughs> please, well, his son Craig told me that his father really, really liked the movie. But when his father told Craig that he really liked the movie, his father also told him, "Don't tell that to Errol." <laughs> McNamara is a kind of withholding guy. I was always scared that he was going to send me to Nam. I felt I had to be careful. You know, it's years after the fact, but perhaps still not too late. <laughs> well, and it's not, nothing to, I mean, it, it, what, what Errol described is, is quite unique, but McNamara spent the last five to 10 years of his life going around and trying to, to win a lot of people over. I mean, he would show up at historians' conferences. He would, I mean, he was. Bizarre. Yeah. Bizarre. Go to Vietnam with historians. He took a whole group. There were a couple of these books about his, his trips to Vietnam. I think part of that was his appealing to a, a different. One world. of my very favorite stories does not particularly reflect well on McNamara. Is that he's over in Hanoi at this conference where he's meeting all of his counterparts. Um, 
He claims that it's at this meeting that he finally discovers that the second attack in the Gulf of Tonkin never occurred. Uh, now, Johnson, in his tape-recorded telephone conversations, knew this within a couple of days. <laughs> um, did McNamara really take, you know, 30 plus years to come to this conclusion? I got into it with him. Um, I remember someone told me that the job of a psychiatrist when you were in uh, therapy was to ensure that you kept coming to therapy, <laughs> to never say anything that was so alienating, the alienist who alienates, um, that you would just uh, say, fuck it, I'm not coming to this anymore. I had a similar problem with McNamara, to be honest. I mean, I couldn't just simply confront him with stuff and have him just walk off. And believe me, he would walk off. He's a volatile, difficult, ornery cuss. Um, after I finished the movie, I went after him about the Gulf of Tonkin stuff. Because, yes, okay, you got it out of me. I have a guilty conscience about the whole goddamn thing. Um, and it's interesting what happened when I tried to press him on this issue. Come on. Come on, Bob. <laughs> you must have known. Um, it's the must have known thing, you know. Come on, Al. You knew they were killing Jews. It's a question ultimately about psychology and about our ability to compartmentalize our thinking, to deceive ourselves, to efface the reality of who we are and what we've done. Um, McNamara had on his desk at the Pentagon, uh, Pentagon he had a, a piece of shrapnel um, from the first attack. And he would always, you know, say, well, you know, the first attack occurred. Just, yeah, well, what about the second attack, sir? Um, I don't know if it can ever be answered. And I tried. It's interesting when you're a historian and you want to beat your head against the wall, which I'm, I'm a real fan of. I, I, as much as the next guy, like beating my head against the wall. Here's another... Here's another detail you might find interesting. I always think that I am babbling, so forgive me. The beginning of the fog of war shows all of these battleships, right? And we found this material in the National Archives, which is, by the way, one of the truly amazing libraries uh, in the world. So you find all of this stuff in the National Archives, the, 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 the credits of fog of war. What, what was this material? Within a month of the attacks in the Gulf of Tonkin, the Defense Department paid for film crews to reenact the attacks. And it was never edited. These were raw dailies. You see the clappers and everything. And I... I asked McNamara, of course, well, what the hell is this stuff? What's this reenactment stuff? Uh, you know, your mind immediately goes to a kind of sinister conclusion. Um, that they were trying to create a visual record of something that never happened in order to sell it to the American public. Um, he knew nothing of it. Um, I actually believed he knew nothing of it. I can't. Yeah, he's just, you know, he's, a, he's too much of a big shot. Then we found the name of uh, the director, the guy whose name was on the clapper. He had just died. I just missed him. And I could never, ever, for the life of me, get any information on this. And I tried. I, I, I embark on these crazy quixotic quests. I tried to locate the man who's under the hood in the most famous photograph from 
uh, the Iraq War, the iconic photograph, the uh, hooded man with wires. I tried to locate that guy, spent a year and a half and a lot of money trying to track him down unsuccessfully. Um, sometimes all you can do, there's a phrase that comes to mind, it's in um, Virginia Woolf's novel, The Waves, a phrase that uh, probably I read for the first time somewhere in this vicinity. Um, and she talks about netting a fin in a waste of water. Maybe it's searching for the ineffable or searching for the, uh, the unresolvable, the undefinable, the unreachable, for a kind of elusive certainty that you can never lay your hands on. Um, it's a great way to describe what a historian does. I think that's what, that's what we do. It's a pursuit. I mean, truth, of course, properly considered, no one's going to hand you truth on a platter. Um, well, except in our lectures. Except in, I haven't attended your lectures, but I assume you offer truth on a platter. <laughs> but, um, yeah, uh, it, it's a pursuit of some sort. Um, people would have loved if I'd been able to sort of arm wrestle him to the ground. You know, you fucker, you killed all these people and you're not even sorry, are you? That's the sequel. You should be ashamed of yourself. You're very, very bad. McNamara came over to our house several times for dinner. The last time he was over, he uh, fell on his way to the bathroom and he opened a cut in his forehead. Oh. He's, he's bleeding, horribly, he's bleeding. <laughs> um, we're semi-hysterical, my wife and myself. Uh, we better get him to the hospital immediately. He's 87 years old. There's no spring chicken. And uh, of course, he refuses to go to the hospital. He refuses everything. He just wants a cold compress to put against his head. And you know, he soldiers on. And uh, my wife looked at me and she said, you know, like 40 years ago, we would be heroes. We killed McNamara. <laughs> and now... <laughs> and now, you know, we're, we're horrified. <laughs> He's our dinner guest. Well, I guess that's and I do like, what can I say? I, I, would, I would joke. I'd say he's my favorite war criminal. I don't know that many war criminals. He was by far my favorite war criminal. I love the guy. My wife would call him the Flying Dutchman, which I think is a really great description of McNamara, uh, of a guy who is just destined to roam the world forever looking for salvation, for redemption, for forgiveness. Oh, I forgot these, sorry, this, this story. He goes to this conference in Hanoi and he gets into an argument because why? They've published in retrospect in Vietnam without giving him royalties. So I think, you know, Bob, let that one go. You know, probably best not to press that one. You know, I think it's, no, 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 no. They shouldn't, they shouldn't have published it illegally. You should, of course, get royalties for it, but let that one go. Just a, a small piece of advice from a friend. How do you, how do you negotiate, Errol, as a historian, as a moral philosopher, um, the fact that you like or clearly fascinated and perhaps even enjoy um, people and maybe even respect them as individuals who did horrible things? Yeah, it's kind of tricky. I, um, I interviewed Dan Ellsberg. Because I thought, well, maybe I'll do a Dan Ellsberg movie. And someone did do it. They got nominated for an Oscar and blah, blah, blah. Um, I did this interview with Ellsberg. It was horrible. It was a horrible interview. I hated it. Um, the whole number of reasons. But it occurred to me while I was, I was uh, doing the interview That here, on one hand, you had Robert McNamara, and Dan Ellsberg, make mis no mistake, was a McNamara wannabe. Um, 
on one hand, you have McNamara, who I believe with the best intentions in the world did incalculable evil. And on the other hand, you have Dan Ellsberg, who with the worst intentions in the world did incalculable good. So good. What are we to make of this? Yes. Oh, I can ask another question. Go ahead, Brian. Yeah, you could even do you could do two. Yeah, uh, I guess we'll do this. We'll make we'll make this as a twofer. Okay. So <laughs> I read a book recently called the Eating the Dinosaur. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um I interviewed two people from an organization called the Mega Society which is uh, people who have IQs of, uh, you know, I, I don't know how many standard deviations above the mean, maybe five. Mensa, <laughs> Mensa is one in 30. Um, the mega society is, I think, one in 10,000 or maybe more. Um, so they can't even really give a numerical figure to their IQ. Um, 190, 195, 200, 205, your guess is as good as mine. What they do is they devise IQ tests for themselves so that they can measure their own IQ. Well, this stuff has always fascinated me because I, got, I was the recipient of an 87 on an IQ test in ninth grade. So I have more than a kind of like passing interest in this whole phenomenon of IQ. The guidance counselor at the time looked at me and said, uh, in giving me the results of my test, said, you know, Errol, you seem to be a lot brighter than you really are. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I said, well, you know, I just, I kind of make that extra effort, you know, I, 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 I try to use big vocabulary words and things like that. You know, I, uh, they're tricks. When you're really, really, really stupid, they're tricks that you can learn to looking a lot smarter than you really are. Like making films. <laughs> but these guys, these guys with the 200 IQ, were, I mean, it becomes a kind of joke, but they were retarded. I mean, they were, I don't know how else to describe it. They were really just retarded. Well, I'd be very curious what you think of the most recent film, Tabloid, because Tabloid is a return. Although uh, Werner Herzog said something very nice about the film. He said a number of very nice things about the film, but one of the things he said, it was a kind of compilation of all of my concerns rolled into one, which I think What's tabloid about? Tabloid is a story, um, uh, it's mining, I guess, an even deeper vein than the story of Robert S. McNamara. It's about a former beauty queen um, who kidnaps a Mormon priest and rapes him in chains in a love cottage uh, in Devon, England, is arrested, incarcerated in the UK. Uh, it's my sex and chains story. I hope the first among many. <laughs> another thing is, here's another thing that I hate about documentary, about plying the trade of documentary filmmaking, is this idea that somehow the importance of the movie derives from the importance of the underlying subject matter. Um, and the idea of going back to doing things that really are more properly speaking about nothing, and hence I think more profound, <laughs> is appealing. I, uh, <laughs> can't win with McNamara. Can I tell one McNamara story fast? It's a very fast story. My favorite McNamara story, which uh, was told to me by someone who worked with him at the, uh, the Pentagon. 
he was absolutely on time, absolutely on time, within seconds, for every meeting. So as a joke, some of his closest associates moved his clock forward 10 minutes. Uh, he walks into the room. Without looking at the clock, he says, I'm not late, and it's not funny. So it somehow it says a great deal does say a lot about, about, about the man. What, as, a, as maybe a closing question, Errol, this has been wonderful. Uh, and thank you for your Is time. Okay, I hope. It's, yeah, okay, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, what, what would you say to young people today uh, in term, as they're thinking about their career paths? It's a different era we live in, uh, but people are similarly struggling with a lot of the issues you've talked about. But at least I hear, uh, as a professor, I hear students you know, uncertain how they should go about making a career and keeping a social consciousness, being a historian but not necessarily just being in the library. Uh, and every era struggles with that. What, what advice, if any, do you have for, for people today? Well, you can make a difference. An investigation, say, of a crime, a murder, what have you, it's a form of history. It really is history, properly considered. Um, you're dealing with the same kinds of historical questions. We're trying to take um, evidence uh, from the past uh, and to try to figure out actually what happened. Uh, history is a crime scene, um, and uh, part of it, uh, our job is to sort of entangle that crime scene and to make sense out of it. Um, but can you make a difference? Yeah, of course you can make a difference. Um, and history is, uh, it's one of the truly noble enterprises because it's one of the ways in which we try to figure out who we are and, and the nature of the world we live in and what higher goal we live in. Well, I think on that note, we should all thank Errol Morris for a fascinating <laughs>